awesome God this morning, this afternoon. So thankful and grateful that we are able to get more and more of Jesus. And every day we get more and more of Jesus. Life gets a little bit sweeter. It gets a little bit more sweeter. So I will not believe the point this, this afternoon. And I invite you to stand to your feet if possible. And join me in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. And we'll read two verses. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. We'll read verse 18 and 19. The Gospel of Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse number 18. So when you find it, say amen. I'll read in your hearing Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse number 18. The Bible says in Luke 4, 18 and 19, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has set me, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I want to read that again for emphasis. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to present me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. You may be seated in the house of God today. I want to put a tag on this text and with your prayers and God's power, I want to preach under the sermonic question, who is the Messiah? Who is the Messiah? I feel like I'm in Florida this afternoon. Um, it, it, it's, it's getting warmer. Amen, there's no snow. But it's getting, it's getting warmer. <laughs> it's getting warmer, it's getting warmer. So who is the Messiah? Who is the Messiah? I've discovered, church, that life is full of questions. Whether you are questioning where babies come from, to who you are and what your purpose is, to questions such as, if God is so good, why is there so much evil? Questions are good, they're part of the human experience. In every space that you occupy, oftentimes you're asking questions. It would be beneficial for you in a relationship that you ask some questions. That you ask some questions about who your parents are, where do they come from, um, what type of goals that you have for your life. Questions are good. It would be beneficial for you to ask questions when you are obtaining a job, like how much money am I going to get paid? Um, um, what days of the week will I be working? Those are good questions to ask. Questions are good for the Christian experience. And here we arrive to the text. The Gospel of Luke, although not explicitly stated, many biblical scholars conclude was written by the global gospel Gentile Luke. According to biblical evidence, Luke was a physician by profession, and this is why Luke has the most descriptive account of the crucifixion compared to any gospel writer. Luke is typically described as a companion book to the book of Acts as it continues, as, as he continues rather, his proclamation of Jesus as the hero in and through humanity. While Luke never physically meets Jesus, Luke expresses a joy and excitement about Jesus the Christ who laid down his life to save you and me. Luke's objective is to uh, is it Luke's objective as he addresses Theophilus, a man who had already been taught about Christianity, is that you will know with certainty that Jesus is the Messiah. In Luke chapter one, he begins the book of by eloquently introducing Jesus as a historical figure, but then he shifts 
as he uses two critical words in Luke chapter 1, eyewitness and ministers. Luke, who is accustomed to con con conducting autopsy, concludes by usage of these two words, he made an autopsy of the records of those who he had been eye who had been eyewitness and confirmed with certainty, certainty and assurance that Jesus is the Messiah. Luke lays out this framework in understanding that he had to do his due diligence, his research, his effort to come to the conclusion who is the Messiah. I would like to suggest to you Luke is not soliciting an amen or hallelujah, but rather Luke's underlying question to the reader is, do you have assurance? Assurance is a believer's confidence in God, God's response to prayer and the hope of eternal salvation. While many may understand the concept of assurance, many believers struggle with accepting and receiving assurance in God, especially when it comes to salvation. You see, scripture is packed with promises of assurance through Jesus. And, and I want to take some time this, more, this afternoon and really go through some scriptures as we lay the framework of understanding this concept of assurance. Go with me to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 verse 13. And the Bible says, 1 John chapter 5 13, the Bible says, these things I have written to you to believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Luke is making this argument as he utilizes all these scriptures and passages to make us understand that, that salvation is not a fairy tale, but salvation is real. In a culture where fitting in is more important than serving God, maintaining preferences than elevating the word of God and building platforms and generating likes than building spiritual habits for Christian growth, we have become biblically, illiterally, morally compromised and spiritually desensitized. Assurance is not how much you do for someone or God. It's not based on a feeling. It's not an event. It's not even an experience. It's not even knowing how holy you may think you are. Assurance starts with the truth of God's word, exists exclusively in the work of Jesus, and increases through obedience to God's word, and is supported by visible fruit. The question for us as Luke is eliciting our thought and our, 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 our response is, do you have assurance? Luke continues in chapter 1 as he contrasts Herod with Zacharias and, uh, and Elizabeth. Luke teaches a critical principle that I believe is important for the reader today that is central to the Christian experience. We are sinners in need of a savior. Now, I know you go to church every week, you read your Bible, you know and can quote every scripture, but I stop by to tell you, we need God. Amen. I'm still not coming through. It was a couple of days ago, and I'm connecting with an employee at my place of employment about an issue that needed to be addressed and resolved. And in my interaction with her, she articulates her problem. I'm listening, but I'm preparing a response in my mind, getting ready to let her know what the issue is. And, and, and I can guarantee you the responses were not going to be pleasant. I paused and I told her I needed to call her back. I walked upstairs and grabbed a drink of water and my wife looks at me and she says, baby, are you okay? I looked at her and saw and, 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 and I looked at her and said, this employee is driving me nuts. I, I, I sat down and began to reflect as I said a quick prayer because truth be told, for the past couple of days, I have been irritable and low tolerance because I was operating on my own strength and not in the Lord's strength because I recognize that I need God. 
When I am not connecting with God, I am irritable. I am easily annoyed, quickly frustrated, less inclined to give grace. And in a real sense, my whole day in life is all out of whack because I need God. Luke elaborates this ideal in verse chapter 1 verse 10 as he mentions this whole multitude was praying eliciting the reader to understand that we need God every day every hour every minute we need God Amen. it is important for it is it is a it is a detriment rather of the believer to live a life absent of God. A life without God is like driving a car with no tires, riding a bike with no wheels, going on vacation with no money, having a significant other with no commitment. It just doesn't make sense. There are some that would suggest that you need to live your life because you only live once, but the devil is a liar. I'm not trying to just live once. I'm trying to live for eternity. Closer to the end of chapter one, Luke introduces the story and circumstances related to the birth of John the Baptist while paralleling it to the birth of Jesus in chapter two. He uses a writing style called alternation. In essence, he is alternating our, our, our attention to describe the order or succession of each person. Luke clearly identifies John as a successor in the Old Testament prophets through his alternation, his, his alternating presentations. Luke links John and Jesus, whom Luke also identifies as a prophet. Since he also sees Jesus far more than a prophet, Luke's device of alternation Alternation goes beyond comparison to contrast with Jesus presented as son of the most high and the messianic deliverer. The structure of the section could be surmised in four different aspects in this text. It goes by talking about the announcement of, John, of John's coming birth. Then it moves to the announcement of Jesus' coming birth. And then it moves to Elizabeth's blessing of Mary. And then Mary's praise to God. And then John's birth. And then Jesus' birth. The structure of this section is powerful as it reaches a shouting moment in chapter 2 verse 13 when the Bible says suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared mm -hmm. with the angel and praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven mm -hmm. and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Luke is trying to elicit or get the reader to start thinking or give a response from the reader as he asserts that God worked out our salvation before we knew we needed a savior. <laughs> That's shouting news. That's shouting news because while I was living a life contrary to God, God worked out a plan for my salvation. Um, you're still not understanding this. Let me give you some Bible because I'm telling you that God worked out your plan of salvation before you even knew you needed salvation. Romans 5, 8, 9 puts it like this. But God demonstrates his love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us since we have now been justified by his love by his blood how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him the biggest challenge for humanity is accepting the gift of salvation in Jesus as we live our lives absent of Jesus I would like to suggest to you there is nothing worse than missing out you know, I remember a couple of years ago um, in communication with my, my sister, she, she usually educates me about all these different sayings and memes because I can't keep up. They're, they change so much. Um, but but I, was, I was having a conversation with her and, 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 and in the text she, she, she wrote um, F-O-M-O, uh, -O. I'm FOMO. I'm like, what is a FOMO? 
Um, and, 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 I'm, and, I'm, and I'm trying to understand, like, what does that mean? Like, we were talking about going on a, a, a destination. I think we were going to Florida, whatever the case may be. And she was in Indianapolis, and she was like, I'm, 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 I'm experiencing FOMO right now. And, and I'm like, are you trying, and, and no disrespect, are you trying to say homo? Like, what does that mean? Like, I was completely clueless. I didn't know what she was talking about. And, and then, and then she, 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 she began to educate me. She says, it just means fear of missing out. And as we live our life absent of God, I would like to suggest to you that there is nothing more worse than fear of missing out on Jesus. Several years ago, several years ago, I'm still not coming through. Several years ago, I am working at a place of employment. I've been working there for about two years. And, and, and I'm going to college at the same time. And, 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 I, and I was someone that always had to work through college. Um, it, it built a lot of character. But, but working when you are you in school is hard, y'all. It's, it's hard. It's, it's something that, that is not ideal because if you're not working, you can focus on those studies. Somebody say amen. amen. But, but, but circumstances in life sometimes puts you in positions where you just have to do what you have to do. And I'm working while I am in college and, and I'm preparing to graduate community college and I'm having a conversation with a coworker who begins to explain me how the company has been so good to him. And I'm looking at him like, you crazy. Like this company has been horrible. And he's saying, no, this company has been amazing to me. And he's like, it's been so good to me for the past three years, and I'm like, I've been here two years, and it's been a rough experience going to school, just started explaining to him, and he said, and he says, um, it's been great to me because for the past three years, I've been receiving tuition assistance. I'm, 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 I'm looking at him, I'm like, tuition, what? what? What do you mean you've been getting tuition assistance for the past three years? I've been working here two years, and, and, I, and, and I, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, one of the benefits you get when you get employed with this company is that they give you tuition reimbursement. I'm, I'm two years now, I'm in my feelings, y'all. I'm, I'm mad because I'm graduating, I'm getting ready to leave the company, and I missed out on $20,000 of tuition reimbursement. I missed out on all of it because I wasn't aware of the benefits that came with this place of employment. You see, it is possible that because of life and all of circumstances and you struggling with faith and doubt, you are missing on the benefits of serving God. It is possible that I could have prevented financial distress, mental anxiety, and physical complications by simply accessing what was available to me. There are some who are struggling financially alone, but you have not access, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. There are some who are struggling with sexual desires, but you have not access, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear but when you are tempted he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it there are some that are struggling alone with decisions regarding school relationships and just life and because you are not access James 1 verse 5 if any of you lacks wisdom should you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given in unto you. You need to access <laughs> what is available to you. Amen. Don't miss out. Access what is available to you. When we serve God, it changes our lives. It aids us in facing trials and motivates us to move forward with and in faith. In chapter 3, Luke, Luke intentionally, intentionally, in the details lays the, 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 the depiction of John preparing the way for Jesus Christ. 
the word Christ is not Jesus' last name as some might surmise. In the first century, that kind of naming was accomplished by saying where someone was from or who their father was. Jesus of Nazareth is an example or Jesus son of Joseph is another example. Instead, Christ is a title like someone calling a teacher or doctor. That also means Messiah. So when we say Jesus Christ, we are describing his identity. He is Jesus, the Messiah. The term Messiah through its Hebrew translation simply means the anointed one. The special title of Messiah is never used in the Old Testament, but rather the messianic hope and seed line through which Jesus would be born. In order to understand Luke chapter 4, we have to take a detour to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Can I teach it for a little bit, church? The word of God gives us insight as to, as, to what, as to that which is to be revealed in the book of Luke. Go with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. We're going to go to two places of scripture so we can lay some foundation as it relates to the understanding of the Messiah. Luke chapter 9 beginning in verse number 6. Luke 9 beginning in verse number 6. When, six, when you find it, say amen. The Bible says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jump over to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse number 1. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse number one, understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse number one. The Bible says, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely. He was born, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, was put, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. 
By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The text teaches that if we need to, un if we want to understand who the Messiah is, the text teaches that the Messiah was and is radically rejected. Jesus was a Galilean, which was from a region in the north part of Israel, an area of Israel often disrespected and looked down upon as it is described in John chapter 741. As they're talking about Jesus here, others said this is the Christ, but some said is the, is, is the Christ to come from Galilee? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet errs from Galilee. Because when they thought about Galilee, they, 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 they never associated greatness or Jesus or rather the Messiah coming from Galilee. Jesus from Nazareth, which is a real, in a real sense, the ghettos of Israel, as they asked the question in John 1 46, can anything good come from Nazareth? I would like to suggest to you that wherever and whenever something is, whenever, wherever and whenever something or someone is popular, it requires intentional prayer. The life of Jesus was one that brought about, that brought about many fanatics or fans, but very few disciples or followers. If they disrespected and rejected Jesus, how much more will those reject you who are serving Jesus? Serving Jesus is not about what people want to hear. It's about sharing what people need to hear. Serving Jesus is not about living how you want to live. It's about creating a space for God to live inside of you. Serving Jesus is not about doing what you want to do, but rather doing what God calls you to do. A life with Jesus won't bring popularity or likes, but serving Jesus brings peace and promises through his word. The text teaches that the Messiah was not only radically rejected, but the Messiah was someone who was a suffering servant. It is way too often we teach a life with Jesus is lilies and roses, rainbows and sunshine. But the Bible teaches, the Bible teaches a life with Jesus is one of suffering and service. Jesus is not your genie in a bottle. He is not your wish machine. He is not your, your slot machine. But, but Jesus is one who, who wishes that you will aspire in life, that you will grow, that you will obtain eternal life through him. Jesus wants you to be connected to him. The life of Jesus, the life, living a life in Jesus is more about sacrifice and service than about popularity. The Bible puts it like this in first chapter in first Peter chapter five. Go with me to first Peter chapter five. I want to go through these texts because I want you to read it and see it for yourself when it comes to a life in Jesus. First Peter chapter five, first Peter chapter five, beginning in verse number 10. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse number 10. The Bible says, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. In other words, as Pastor Montgomery asserted last week, the life of a Christian, it's a hard knock life for us. If you serve God, it's not lilies and roses, but living the life of a Christian is hard. 
It's hard as you navigate life with so much obstacles and barriers and so much distraction because if you want to serve God, you need to stay locked in in Jesus. The text teaches that Jesus was not only someone who was radically rejected. He was not someone who was only a suffering servant, but also the text teaches that the Messiah was someone and is someone who lovingly liberates. All throughout scripture, we see God operating as the hand of justice and as liberator and the advocate for the underdog. You see, God is a God. Every time you look at scripture, it, it, you, you, you recognize that if you see an underdog, Jesus is usually rooting for the underdog. Come on. <laughs> the underdog, the underdog, all throughout scripture, David was the underdog, but God, but through God slayed the giant. Moses was the underdog, but through God took down Pharaoh. Daniel was the underdog, but through God had a picnic with lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the underdogs, but through God could roast marshmallows in a fire because the Messiah lovingly liberates. The Messiah, the Messiah was and is radically rejected, was and is a suffering servant and lovingly liberates his children. The question that Luke is trying to elicit from the reader today, will you receive the Messiah in your life? I, I, I know, I know, I know that there are some that may be wrestling with the idea that that living for God uh, takes too much sacrifice, it takes too much uncomfortability, it takes too much adjustment, but the truth be told, everything good comes with sacrifice. Right. Marriage is not good without sacrifice. Raising children is not good without sacrifice. Obtaining an education is not good without sacrifice. Leadership is fruitless without sacrifice. And serving Jesus is pointless without sacrifice. Because with sacrifice comes the Lord's favor. The question for the reader, the hearer today through the word of God is how much are you willing to sacrifice to obtain the Messiah in your life today? As the musician begins to play, I want to call to your thought process and your understanding of who the Messiah is. The Messiah is not someone that you only hear about or watch on TV. The Messiah is Jesus. That's who it is. Jesus who died for us. Jesus died for us so that we can have life and life more abundantly. I don't know about you, but I refuse to go through all this misery on earth to get to a point when Jesus comes back and Jesus looks at me and says, I never knew you. There is nothing in this world that is worth sacrificing serving Jesus. There's nothing worth it. Money is not enough for you to get rid of Jesus relationship him or her it's not enough to give up on Jesus no leader no organization no spouse no child is worth you missing out on Jesus because Jesus wants us to live with him forever my question for you will the struggle on this earth be in vain Will the cries that you have, the tears rather, that you have shed after each individual that has passed away, will it be in vain? Will the relationships that almost broke you but Jesus got you to a point where you are mentally functioning and you thought you would have lost it but you made it through because of Jesus? 
is it worth it? Is all the struggles that you went through through obtaining education and trying to do great things in this life, is it worth it giving up on Jesus? I don't know about you, but I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus. I love my wife. She's someone that that, that I believe that God has blessed me immensely, but I'd rather have Jesus than even my spouse. Because there's nothing more important than Jesus. There's no one more important than Jesus. So whatever that's going on in your life today, I'm calling you to make a decision today. If it's standing in the way between you and Jesus, get rid of it. The songwriter says, nothing in between my Lord and my Savior. Nothing in between. That relationship is not worth it. That job is not worth it. Those habits are not worth it. Give your life to Jesus today. Jesus is calling you to give your life to him today. Our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. Someone needs to make a decision today because you've been struggling. You've been struggling with these questions and asking, do I really need to make this adjustment for Jesus? The question is yes. Jesus is telling you that he is your all in all. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants you to live with him eternally. He's saying, here I am. Come to me. Come to me all who are heavy laden and burdened and I will give you rest. There's someone in the house of God today that's saying that I, I, I need to get to know this Messiah, this person who was radically rejected, this person who was a suffering servant, this person who lovingly liberates. I want to get to know him. If that's your desire, desire, I ask you that you will stand to your feet you're saying that i want to get to know jesus for myself if that's your desire i invite you to stand to your feet our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed the church is praying right now as someone needs to make a decision you're saying lord i want to give my life to you jesus because nothing is more important than serving you the call has been made God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. The next appeal is the appeal that I want to challenge every believer in the house of God. I don't know where you are in your spiritual life. I don't know where you are in your Christian growth. But one thing that I have learned throughout this pandemic, of coming out of this pandemic, this pandemic has scarred Christians so much so that Christians are struggling spiritually to even pray. We've gotten out of the habits of coming to church and service. We've gotten out habits of getting engaged with Christ on a consistent basis and now we're blaming everything on the pandemic but the pandemic is not to blame the reality is we needed some refinement in our Christian lives and someone under the sound of my voice you're saying Lord I need to re-evaluate reset I need to hit the reset button Lord God I need the reset if that's you, I invite you to get to your feet and stand to your feet. You're saying, Lord, I need to reset the button, Lord. Lord, I need to be more intentional in, 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 in connecting with you every day, every hour. Lord, I need you every hour. Every hour, I need thee. Somebody's saying, Lord, I need you. I need to hit the reset. Lord, help me in this endeavor. So we're praying right now, God, thank you for being someone who loves us so much that you sent the Messiah, 
Jesus Christ to come face the penalty that we deserved so we can live a life that he deserved. So God, we're thankful and grateful for that. And God, I'm praying that you will forgive us for the lackadaisical attitude that we have presented related to prioritizing Jesus in our life. God, there's nothing more important than you. Whatever's coming in between you and I, Lord, for the sake of me obtaining eternal life, remove it. Whatever's coming in between God, I'm giving it to you because nothing is worth it. So God, as we're praying right now, we're asking God that as we hit this reset button related to our growth and getting deeper into your word and into relationship with you, God, I'm praying that you will help us with distractions, God. God, we have so many distractions. We're so busy. We got every excuse, every justification for anything that we should be doing. And God, I'm praying that you will help us to get our house in order. God, you are important to us. The television is not more important than you. Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, YouTube, they're not important, more important than you, God. Help us to get rid of distractions. God, whatever it takes, get us to be in, li in line with you. Get us to be on the same page with you. Help us to pray. Help us to read your word. Help us to connect daily. Help us to share the good news with others so that when you return, you'll be able to say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. So for this, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.